Okay, good morning. Good morning, Charlie. <laughs> and then uh, welcome to First Baptist Church here in Grayton, California. A little chilly this morning when I got here, so the heat had to be turned on right away. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Most Heavenly Father, God, you are so awesome and you are so wonderful and we could sing, I could sing, I could praise you all day long. Lord, everything in our lives help us to remember about you. You and your love and your long suffering. Lord, we know you, we love you. We know that you love us and Lord, we in turn love you. Help each one of us here today and watching online. Lord, help each one of us to just know your love and to share that love with others so that they may come to have such peace and understanding that comes only through your love and the love of your son, Jesus Christ, and the filling of the Holy Spirit that we receive. Thank you, Lord. Be with all those that are traveling on today. Be with all those that are not feeling well. Uh, be, all, be with all of those who struggle with whether or not to go outside to the beach or to come to church or worship you, Lord. Be with them all that they may feel that drawing, that pull from you, Lord, to come and corporately worship together with other brothers and sisters. Thank you, Father. I'll be with our nation. Be with the nation of Israel. Be with all those that are impacted by the wars, by the hatred that's out there. Lord, be with our nation, the United States of America, as we go into our four-year presidential election. Lord, you know who it is that's running. Lord, we ask that regardless of who is elected, Lord, that your hand will be on them and guide them and that they will sense you, Lord, that they will know the direction that you would have us go in and that they would be obedient to that and that they would follow that, Lord. Lord, our nation, as always, is in your hands. It's not in the hands of any politicians, Lord. It's in your hands, Lord. Help each one of us to remember that. And Lord, we, we ask that you heal our land. Heal our land, Lord. It's so divided. Help us, Lord, to come together as one nation under God. One nation under you, Lord. Help that to be true once more. As always, Lord, we um, ask this in and through your son's precious, precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, um, join with me in the with the collect of the day that you uh, find there in your bulletin. Almighty and everlasting God, in Christ you have revealed your glory among the nations. Preserve the works of your mercy that your church throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in the confession of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I almost said one nation under God, because that was just, you know, I was just praying that. And yes, one nation under God, that's what I pray that we continue to stay. Okay, our first song of two songs is number 447, Trust and Obey. Oh 
and obeying for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey and one of the things that will probably come through I hope that will come through in the sermon today is that if we are trusting and obeying then we won't have the conflicts that most people have with the flesh with the flesh so just in case people didn't realize this is when Somebody's up here leading the music, and we look down and we see you yawn. That's not a good thing. Not because we're insulted by a yawn, because people have to yawn. They might be tired. They might have lack of oxygen. But yawns are contagious. <laughs> and when you try to sing, and then you see somebody yawn, and it's like, oh, my goodness. <sighs> Part of it's power of suggestion, I think. But I just had to say, it. I'm giving... You guys have a hard time. All right. <clears throat> so the sermon is going to be out of uh, Galatians 5, 16 through 25. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, on the back, and I'm not, on the back of the bulletin, um, I printed it out in case... Um, you didn't want to open up your Bible? Well, so many people just used to have it in the scripture right there uh, in front of them. And also, maybe to help, I'm CK out. She just recently had some eye surgeries. She's having a hard time seeing sometimes. <laughs> so, you have a few options. You can open up your Bible. You can look at the back of the bulletin. Or you can look at it on your phone. Okay. Um, so let's, I'm going to read, and you can follow along, or if you want to read with me, you can. I, I don't usually, I don't usually print out from the uh, uh, New International Version, but the translation I thought did a good job with it, so I'm going to read, and I printed that out. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
But the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. In the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh? They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Verse 18. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Verse 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft. Hatred. Discord. Jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Well, Heavenly Father, Lord, as we go forward with this a sermon and reading what you've placed on my heart, Lord. And Lord, I just ask that um, we can hear what it is that you may be saying to us. Thank you, Lord. We ask this as always, and through your son's precious name. Okay, so... When Michael asked me, on very short notice, like four days, uh, he asked me to do um, you know, the service today. And then I'm also preaching next Sunday. Uh, and he asked me, and when he asked me, I, I knew immediately what I was going to do it on. Because earlier in the week at an online Bible study, I was speaking with some folks and I was on my speaker phone in my car, sitting in the Narrows in Nevada, you know, on the 101, stuck in traffic, and on my way up here, and uh, we were in the prayer part of the Bible study, and I asked for patience because of what the situation was, and then I realized, well, I already have that patience because uh, I have the Holy Spirit and I have the fruits of the Spirit and one of the, a part of the fruit of the Spirit is patience. And so I said back to them, I said, don't pray for patience for me. And a lot of, and the reason I thought about that is because a lot of people, let's see, I've been in Christ since 1995. And I often hear people in the, in the church say, don't ask for patience because then everything is going to happen and you're going to need it. Uh, and that's nowhere in the scripture. Uh, so I didn't want to push it. So anyways, as soon as Michael said, hey, I'm sorry for the short notice. And I said, Michael, I know exactly what I'm going to preach on and that's patience. Well, as this week, as I was reading the passages and studying it. I said, you know, this is about more than patience. This is about walking in the Spirit, living by the Spirit. What's the the scripture right there said at the very beginning? It says, Paul says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will be not you will not be gratified by the flesh, desire of the flesh. And then he ends it, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And all of that is to remind me and then to share with you that we have, if we have the Spirit, those of us who are in Christ, we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And with that Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, comes the fruit. Not fruits, but the fruit, a single fruit, 
Kind of think of a, a grapes, a cluster of grapes. You know, a bunch of grapes. The one thing itself is singular, and then all the little grapes on it. All the little fruits are part of the whole fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you are in the spirit, you have these things. In this passage, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, lists for us a set of vices and a set of virtues. And they say patience is a virtue. Basically, what it's about, it's about the flesh, which is what we live in, and we're in it until we die. Once we are out of our flesh and we are with the Lord Jesus Christ, we will have a peace beyond understanding. But as long as we're in our flesh, we have a peace, you know, a quietness about us because we have the Holy Spirit. However, because we're in the flesh, there is always going to be a conflict between the desires of the flesh and the Spirit of God. So this passage is basically about this flesh and it's about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Paul wants his readers, and of course that includes us, to realize that when we focus on the flesh, which is regretfully, we, we kind of do that without thinking. We're always thinking about ourselves. We're not thinking about others. And I'm not saying that each person here and each person that listened does that intentionally. It's just how, it's just the nature we think automatically about ourselves and how things affect us as we walk closer and closer to the Lord Jesus Christ as we grow in maturity with the Holy Spirit then we start thinking more about other people than we do thinking about ourselves but as we start out as we're growing as new Christians and wherever we might be in our walk with our, our relationship with God relationship with Jesus Christ, relationship with um, the Holy Spirit. I can remember a time where, you know, I would think to myself when I was in church, it's like, wow, is this service ever going to get over with? And now, 20-something years later, my thinking is, I hope that however long the service is, that the people who are here and the people who might be listening online, that they will receive something, that there will be some discernment for them from um, the Holy Spirit. And of course, the people who are online don't have to turn, don't have to watch it. They can just shut it off right now. <laughs> so it can go real fast for them. And of course, I guess those of us that are here, we could just leave too, you know, but... My heart hopes and prays um, that we're led by the Spirit and that we will um, that we'll listen to what is being presented to us. So again, without thinking, we are usually just thinking about ourselves. And when we think about ourselves, I hate to say it, but there's usually negative consequences. When we focus on serving other people, especially through God's love, and living by the Holy Spirit, there is always, always a positive result. It's important to realize that this flesh list includes a number of unexpected items. This list that Paul gives us of fleshly iniquities, sin, it focuses not only on the carnal sins and idolatry, because that's usually when we think about the flesh. We usually think about carnal sins, right? And we think about idolatry. But also included in that list is hatred, strife, jealousy, fits of rage. I've been guilty of that periodically. Selfish ambition, dissension, factions, gossip, envy. These two, though they're not always 
externally obvious as sexual immoralities, as impurity, as debauchery, as idolatry, as witchcraft, as drunkenness, as orgies. They're also called out by the Apostle Paul as works of the flesh. And when you think about it, they really are. The common characteristics of these vices, these iniquities, reveal themselves in their self-centeredness, in their egotism that underlines all of them. So that which separates us from God is our own idea of self-sufficiency. Meaning we can do it, we don't, we don't need God. We can provide for ourselves, we don't need God. That is our attempt to think and live apart from God. Believing that what we have stems from ourselves, and from ourselves alone, and does not stem from God. With such a self-sufficient stance, coming to expression in all sorts of egotistic ways, or egotistical ways, that have to do with hatred, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, self-ambition, conflicts, divisions, envy, and all of the carnal and idolatry that were mentioned as well. And then on the other side of the list, we have the fruits of the Spirit. The, not the fruits, the fruit. My apologies, it's a singular. It seems that Paul is not concerned with precisely how each one of these matters work out in practice. You know, how does your peace work out? How does your love work out? How does your patience work out? But it's with the underlying orientation of unselfish and outgoing concerns for others. For in commitment to God through Jesus Christ, one discovers a new orientation for life. An orientation that reflects the selfless and outgoing love of God himself. When I'm driving down the freeway, and somebody pulls in front of me and then slows down, I'm thinking about just myself. <laughs> And I'm really infuriated by them. And the old me would have beeped the horn and done some other things. Maybe got real close to them. Maybe drove past them and then slowed down. And all the things you can think of that you might do when it upsets you like that. I probably did. I've even followed in my old ways. I've even followed people off the freeway. Went and saw where they went, pulled up next to them, got out of the car, and wanted to have a conversation with them. I'm told that was quite dangerous, but that was the anger within me for what they did. And I just wanted to know why did they do it. I was thinking about myself. Thank the Lord I got through all of those and that I never, nobody ever pulled a gun on me. One time as I was driving down the freeway, somebody did something like that, and I took my finger and, you know, went like this, like a gun. And then I saw a police officer in a car, you know, like coming up right behind him. Put that gun down. It wasn't really a gun. It was a finger gun. I put that down real fast. That was like God saying to me, hello, Charlene, don't do that. All of that was an example to say how we can act when we're just thinking about ourselves. More than likely, that person who cut in front of us did not do it on purpose and didn't do it to upset us. They, for some reason, believed they needed to, you know, scoot in front of us and slow down. It is freedom from the... Con um, Walking by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, is freedom from that type of contaminating effect of self-importance and self-centeredness with the results that now such virtues as love, joy, 
peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control can be expressed in the Christian life in ways that are beneficial to others and that reflect God at work in our lives, in Christians' lives, apart from our own sinful self-interest. So now when I'm driving down the freeway, I still do get a little irritated. But I immediately will say, God, I know you've already forgiven me, but forgive me that I just allowed myself to be robbed of my joy when that person probably didn't mean to do that. Or God, maybe maybe you had them pull in front of me because there's an accident coming up and it's going to keep me from being in the accident. And then it's like I'm going through a conversation with God about it instead of following the person off the freeway and getting mad at them. Quite a difference between the old me and the new me. But because I'm in the flesh still, as you can see, I'm not a spirit. <laughs> I am all flesh and bones here. Um, that old me still tries to surface. And it's only through walking with God, walking in the spirit, that my walk has gotten closer to God. And so I'm able to uh, handle it. Now, the last three days I have driven over I don't know about 800 miles between uh, Marin and uh, Sebastopol I have animals down south that I'm watching and I have animals up here that I'm watching I made a mistake with my scheduling and that 101 at the Nevada um, uh, Narrows has been a nightmare Usually it's an only an hour drive and the last three trips, including the last one last night at 10 p.m., uh, was a little bit over two hours. Uh, for, you know, accidents, cars stalling out, things on the road. And so the old me has was really trying big time to surface and I kept on like trying to just rest in the spirit. Resting in the spirit. So enough about me and let's get back to God's word. <laughs> but I'm just trying to, you know, give you a little bit of it back and forth here. Examples. Uh, so Paul encourages his converts, you know, those that he has been blessed to bring to Christ, uh, to acknowledge that their new relationship in Christ Jesus involves also being dead to the flesh with its passions and its desires and to live their lives in step with the spirit with such an acknowledgement and a lifestyle having direct re relevance on how they treat one another this is also directly relevant to christians today as we seek to know more fully what it means to live by the Spirit and not live according to the flesh. And as you know, the world we live in is, seems to be more about living in the flesh. Our culture produces what you could call a false freedom or false freedoms. Uh, one that I relate with and I know that others can as well, uh, is gay pride. That, and I'm not picking on folks who identify as gay. I'm only sharing what I know and how I used to be and how um, I am now. You know, the old me and the new me. The fleshly me and now the spiritual me. So gay pride was and still is, not to me but to most, is a false freedom. When I had my first sexual encounter with another woman, it was, at the time, it was freeing. I just cannot express to you how freeing it felt. It took me several years, like over 20 years, to realize that 
when I walked into that sin and thinking it was me and that it was so freeing, I was actually walking into a prison cell. And that the only person that had the key to it was Jesus Christ. I didn't know I was imprisoned, but I was. A while back, um, about well, 18 years ago, 2006, I was at the seminary in Mill Valley. And I uh, wanted to, I was working on a project for how the church can reach out to the gay population. Because we want to reach out to everybody and share the love of Jesus Christ with them, regardless of, of what their life is like. So this was about the time of Brokeback, you remember the movie Brokeback Mountain? It came out back in about 2006. So it was June, and I wanted to go to the Pride Parade. And I wanted to bring along my new camera that I had, a video camera. And I wanted to ask people in the parade, people who were preparing the parade, you know, at the beginning where they're setting it all up, I wanted to ask them some questions. Like, what was their spirituality as a child growing up? What was their spirituality now? And what was their message, if they had any, to the church? I have about 20, 30 minutes of raw footage. And one of the things that they, that, that, um, they said to us, or they said to me, but I had two other people with me as accountability partners, because here I was, a former lesbian, now a seminarian, you know, going to the Gay Pride Parade in San Francisco. If anybody saw me, uh, it could cause a lot of um, havoc. And so I had uh, two people, a husband and wife, that, that came with me to hold me accountable to make sure that nothing happened, that I behaved myself type of thing. And it was not a problem at all. I, actually, I can remember in 2006, going to that parade, my heart was so drawn to this group of people because I remember thinking to myself, that's what I used to believe. And now that I have Jesus, I don't need that. And it's, it was such a freeing thing. So at the, at the beginning of the parade, and, I, and I'll tell you again, and I'll tell you in a minute what they said. Um, but at the beginning of the parade, they have what's called dykes on bikes. And it's all of these ladies with, uh, bic uh, not bicycles, motorcycles. There were some bicycles in there. And uh, they had a funny sign on the front that said, uh, dykes on bikes reject. You know, because they had a, uh, Bicycle instead of a motorcycle. And as the motorcycles, we're talking, oh, I don't know, 150, 200 motorcycles. And they're all at the beginning of the parade and they're revving up their engines and it just, just brought everybody up like this. You know, the, the, uh, the noise and the people cheering and the people screaming and you know, cheering them on and I felt the freedom that that I used to feel it tried to come in and grab me and then immediately I knew what it was it was a false freedom it was all of that coming down trying to get me it's like Charlene come back come back and it was yelling out to the people that were there. It was affirming. It was affirming them. It's like, hey, it's okay to be gay. It's okay to live this life. And my heart went out to these people. And that I'm sure that if some people hearing me say that, and some people who might watch this video, they might just shut it off right now because... It's like, well, you're saying it's not okay to be gay. You know, I'm like, the culture is telling you that it's okay. But it's not okay with God. And when you die, 
and you stand before God. He's not going to be able to say, well done, my faithful servant. I care enough to say this, to share this. And people will say that it's hateful. But it's not. It's actually quite loving. Kind of like when you, I don't have children. But when you say to your kids, you know, don't do that, it's going to hurt. And they still do it. And they hurt. But I'm going away from the main message, though. Maybe that part, right? There was a part of a message for somebody. Our culture is telling people that it's okay to live that life that Paul lists, where he where he lists. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. And then he warns them and he says, As I did before, that those who will live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You're not walking by the Spirit. We want you to walk by the Spirit so that you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Those were sins of the flesh. Sins that we, for the most part, do not know are sins if we are not believers. For the most part, I believe that inside each of us, God created us. And inside each of us is a knowledge of God, a, revel a general revelation of God. We see it all around us. And we know the difference between right and wrong. No matter how we're brought up, we know the difference between right and wrong. There was a time when I was... Committing sins of the flesh. That deep down inside, I had this, like, that's wrong, Charlene. But I still did it anyways. Kind of like when you're driving down the freeway. Here we go with car stuff again, right? Different kind of analogy. Like driving down the freeway, and the speed limit says 65, or 55, or 35, depending on what road in life you're on. So it says 65. Let's go with 55. I feel good at 55. I might drive 65 because, you know, 10 miles over, not a big deal. And you have all these people on, you know, on both sides of you, unless you get in the slow lane, are zooming by you at maybe 80 or 90 miles an hour. But they know the speed limit is 55, but yet they're still... Going over the speed limit. And this is happening more and more on the on the one-on-one -on -one freeway. And I would imagine on just about every other freeway. This morning they were um, on the way up. Uh, they were on the way down and then on the way up. I already made two trips down, up and down the one-on-one -on -one this morning. Uh, I saw at least three police cars and motorcycles. With a little speed checker thing, you know, looking at you. And then there were people speeding and they didn't stop them. But they were trying to identify to these people that it's against the law to do that, right? It's against the law to speed. Posted speed limit. And that's how it is with sin. We know, I believe, inside of us. That it's wrong to do these things. We know when we're sinning. We know. But we push it down. And then there's some things that you just don't know. I haven't like dwelled that deep into it. But I do know from personal experience. There are times when. Especially the fleshly things. things there were times. That I thought about it for a minute. 
And then, of course, there was my mother. My mother and my father always said, you know, don't go to bed with a guy before you get married. And so I knew that because mom and dad told me that. And I also did go to church a few times as a little kid, not a lot. but And so I knew that one. But I worked my way around it. They didn't tell me anything about going to bed with another woman. So, see, that was my rationalization. And that's what we do in the flesh. And I'm not, I don't want it to sound like I'm bragging. I'm trying to explain to you how the flesh works. And I, I think we all know how the flesh works here. If you really think about it. So, we're just talking about false freedoms that the world allows us, especially if we give in to it. But God's Word, the Bible, it insists. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And that's just in Galatians 1, 5 1. The Bible says, do not use your freedom to indulge. The sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. That's in verse 13 of chapter 5. Christian freedom is designed to help us grow in goodness. We can be sure that in affirming freedom, the Christian, each one of us, responds to God's own call. To shake off the old bonds, you know, the, shake off the bonds of the flesh and to find God's pathway, Christ's pathway to goodness. Because when you do, oh my goodness, it's so much more freedom there. And then again, there's, again, there's the battle between being, walking in the spirit, walking by the spirit, that freedom, and then your flesh. You're walking along and everything's going really good and you're enjoying the Lord and the peace that comes with it. And then there's a temptation that comes or somebody irritates us or this or that. And the flesh tries to draw us back down. Don't let it go to God. Say, God, help me here. So when Jesus opened the door to my prison cell of, of homosexuality, and I came to invite him into my heart and accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. The freedom that I experience and that I still experience today is one of a, a childlikeness. I can, I can take the freedom, the false freedom that I felt when I had my first sexual encounter with another woman. I take that. And then I take that relationship with Jesus Christ and it's like here's the false freedom and then I can't reach high enough to ow <laughs> I can't reach high enough up to experience to share with you how high we get from our relationship with Christ I can remember especially after going in uh, you know following in believers in the obedience of believers baptism on November 5th of 1995 is when I was you know, professed to the whole church that I was accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And that Pastor Bob, uh, you know, bent me over like this in the water. And I had on a baptismal gown and he had on a baptismal gown. And uh, I held my nose. And when I came up, it was like, oh my goodness, I had changed. It was like this, I felt like a little kid. And I still feel like that little kid. It's the freedom that is there is no comparison at all to the false freedom the culture gives us. Saying it's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. It's okay to do this, this, this. And we see it all around us. I don't want to mention all of it because we'll be here forever. Okay, so then you have the law. We're not talking about like people's law we're talking about God's law from the Old Testament it's got a long history 
It's been there forever. But it does not produce righteousness. Only relationship with Jesus Christ produces righteousness. Only relationship with God produces righteousness. I already talked about, just a little bit ago, remember the speed limit? What the speed limit is? Seeing the speed limit posted told us what the law was. Don't go over 55. Don't go over 65. When you're driving through the neighborhood and it's, you know, flashing yellow lights, 25 miles an hour when children present. There's children present and people are zooming through at 40 and 50. The law, God wrote the law to open our eyes to our sin. So the law is still needed. Remember what the Apostle Paul wrote? He wrote, I didn't know I was coveting until I read, Thou shalt not covet. Then I knew I was coveting. I knew it was a sin once I read the law. So if the law is being kept, then we won't sin. But we're going to be under the law if we don't accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now that those, all of us here are in Christ, so we're no longer under the law because now we're under the Holy Spirit. Not saying that we can, what this is saying is, it's not saying that we're not under the law anymore, so we can go do whatever the heck we want to. No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying now that you're walking in the spirit, you're not going to want to do those things. So sometimes you might, you know, the flesh might get tempted sometimes. And you're in the Holy Spirit, and so the Holy Spirit, God in you, Christ in you, is going to help you squash it. And if it doesn't, if the flesh is winning the battle, get on your knees. Or on the chair. Do something. Start praying to God about it. Like, give it to him. Oh, when I came out of homosexuality, because I saw in the Bible several times that it said it was a sin, I still hadn't given it up. I mean, I wasn't doing it anymore. But the temptations were still flowing in me. You know, the, the draw was still in me. And I would talk to God. It's like, okay, God, your word says this is a sin, but I keep on wanting to do it. So if you didn't make me this way, please help me not to do that anymore. And it was a long battle. And praise God. The Holy Spirit gave me the strength to fight it. And now, praise God, the attractions just are not there anymore. And so I'm very thankful um, for that. But that doesn't mean I still don't have other temptations. As long as we're in the flesh, we're going to keep being attempted in many different ways. But if you get closer and closer to God through reading the scripture, studying the scripture, worshiping him. You know that song, Just a Closer Walk? Just a Closer Walk with the Patsy Cline does a great job of it. That's what happens. You get closer to God, and so God's got you, like, covered on all sides. You're in a huge bubble of Holy Spirit. And it's harder and harder for the temptation of the flesh to come through. So keep inside that bubble. Keep inside that Holy Spirit bubble. That's the only way I can really explain it. Holy Spirit bubble. I'm completely gone off my notes. So I'm reading to see what I haven't said. <laughs> Okay, so um, one of the most exciting themes in scripture is that of life. In Genesis, in the book of Genesis, we see God giving life to all his creation. We see him breathing a special life into Adam and Eve. Physical life and more. They were spiritually alive. They were aware of God. 
They were capable of having fellowship with him. They walked in the garden. <laughs> they walked in the garden with God. And then they chose to sin. And then they died spiritually. And that spiritual death was passed on to all of us. And that's why I'm standing here today. And you're listening today. Because we're all in the flesh. And people have to speak on it. Ephesians 2. Paul writes, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. All of us also alive among them at one at a time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts like the rest we were by nature. Objects of wrath. People need both human law and divine law without restraints. With each person given license to express their cravings, society will fall, society is falling, and groups and people will prey on those weaker than they, and in turn be prayed, pre prayed to the strong. We see that going on today. If you think this is exaggerated, you're ignorant of history and you're ignorant of current events. The wars, the rapes, the murders, the systematic crimes of economic oppression, private brutalities, all the gangs that are out there from other countries, and then the gangs that we already had. It all fills in the detail of man's fall. The Bible story goes, the Bible story does not stop at death. The Bible goes on to share the good news of life. God made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. When we came by faith into a relationship with Jesus Christ, God plants his own new life within our personalities. Throughout the Old Testament, the writers speak of it. Uh, the Apostle Peter, he focused on it. Uh, in 1 Peter 1.23, he wrote, For you are children of God now, the live permanent word of the living God has given you his own indestructible heredity. There is a new kind of life that's swelling up in us once we become Christians. It's God's kind of life. And our possession of God's life changes everything. And just to, in conclusion, um, in the verses that we read, six times, Paul speaks of the Holy Spirit. He writes, verse 16, live by the Spirit, verse 17. The Spirit is contrary to the sinful nature, verse 18. Led by the Spirit, not under law, verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit, verse 25. We live by the Spirit, verse 25. Keep in step with the Spirit. So if you were doing Bible study like I do Bible study, you'd have a lot of spirits underlined, covered, you know, in your Bible. It's like spirit, 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 all over the place. The dynamics of Christian freedom is freedom found only in the possession of new life, but also in the person of the Holy Spirit. God himself has entered us with his gift of power. Do you remember that day? Do you remember that day when he entered? This spirited and exciting passage contains Paul's explanations of what he meant when he wrote Galatians 2.20. He wrote, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and loves me, and gave himself for me. When we surrender ourselves to the Spirit, to let the Holy Spirit guide and control us, then the Spirit will see to it that we do not gratify the desires of sinful nature. So all that to say, live by the Spirit, 
not by the flesh. Okay, our closing song. As far as I know, there's no announcements. Our closing song, and the, they just rang the siren. Um, I always try to have it done, but that's not always the case, especially when I run late. Number 329, God's Grace. One of my favorite songs. 329. Almost there. A grace greater than our sins, I should say. that got pushed <laughs> in the parking lot. <laughs> I don't know who did that.